everybody? Nice. Did you perform? Yeah. How was it? Bring your talents tonight, okay? Um, and that's it. Just mute your phones. These are the basic ones for today. Enjoy. You know, ask questions. So today's talk is, or this morning, is an engineer's guide to Linux kernel upgrades. We have Ignat Kochagin. He's going to present. And then we want to leave some time for questions. Join the Matrix chats if you haven't already. The cool thing about it is that you can keep the conversation going as long, you know, once the conference ends. So give him our hand and let's get started. Good morning. Uh, thank you for finding the strength to come to my lecture today after yesterday's celebrations. Uh, my name is Signat. I'm from Cloudflare, and today we're going to talk about Linux kernel upgrades, uh, mostly in production systems. And hopefully, after this talk, you will know more uh, ins and outs of Linux kernel upgrades, how they are different from software upgrades, and you will have some tips on how to safely and of often upgrade your kernel in production. Okay, a little bit about myself first. So I run the Linux team at Cloudflare. Uh, I'm passionate about system security and performance, and I enjoy low-level programming uh, kernel, device drivers, bootloaders, and other scary low-level stuff in C. Okay, but before we big dive in, let's do a small show of hands to wake up. Like, imagine you're working, and what would you do in this case? You get a notification. Uh, upgrades available. Who will press the button to apply immediately? Okay, yes, yeah, fine. Who will postpone? Or Oh, wow, wow. <laughs> and this is just your laptops, right? <laughs> so, like, then the next question, like, of all the people who would apply immediately, would you do differently if it was a production system? Oh, who would not do this? Who would still press apply? <laughs> Good job. <laughs> right, so yeah, for production system, upgrades are a little bit like very pain, pain points, right? So you usually have two options, either remind me later or don't do it at all. So <laughs> and, and, and this is natural, right? So... Uh, human beings are conservative and like we perceive, especially software engineers, like we perceive things, uh, changing things as a threat, right? So uh, if it works, like why should we touch it in the first place, right? But th the reality is like we perceive different software we may perceive with different levels of threat. So with regular software updates, yeah, they're bad. Right, they're like a threat, a risk to your production system, and uh, like if it goes bad, it kind of like will somewhat get you in trouble, right? But so grades are monsters, but they're not really that scary. Yeah, they're ugly, annoying, but like we can deal with them, right? When we mention Linux kernel upgrades, so the perception is this, so it's like a all destroying monster which can like destruct the whole planet in like in five minutes. And, and this is, again, this is natural because uh, we kind of know how to deal with bad software upgrades, right? So imagine in this case, we upgraded a service and uh, uh, like, let's say if it just keeps crashing, we can roll it back fast, it's okay. But let's say it kind of works, but once in a while it, it crashes. Right, and, and we know how to deal with that. So it's not an end of the world. So if you use like some kind of service manager, you, you can tell it like, please monitor my service and restart it once in a while. And, uh, and yeah, and the job is done, right? Well, it's not done, but you're kind of, you're not breaking stuff. You're kind of operating in a degraded mode, but it gives you like time to more thoroughly debug things and, and fix it, right? But, when the Linux kernel crashes, right, everything is down. You don't have your system, it's not working, and everything is bad, right? And therefore, like, nobody likes, and nobody wants to risk kernel upgrade. So people 
people naturally av try to avoid it, especially in production systems, right? But uh, if you don't do that, you're really missing out, right? And let's talk about what are the risks of not applying software updates and kernel upgrades in particular. Well, the first and the most obvious things are uh, bugs are not, your bugs are not getting fixed, right? Like, uh, let's assume all good intentions from all software developers. People do not release updates just because they want to. Uh, yeah, they, they introduce new features, new code, but as well as like fix a lot of bugs and therefore it is important to keep up with updates, with software updates and Linux kernel updates in particular because you want these bugs to be fixed. And here is some data. So Cloudflare now usually follows the latest Linux kernel stable long-term release branch, which is currently 5.15. And at the time of compiling this presentation, there were 55 bug fix releases in the 5.15 branch. I will talk about uh, release branches and bug fix releases later in this presentation, but so far there are like 55 releases in the branch which was just bug fixes, right? And this is the data of number of commits, therefore bug fixes in each release, right? And it is, out of 55 releases, we have 29 releases with more than 100 commits, so somewhat with more than 100 bug fixes. And by the way, these releases happen roughly every week, right? So 10 of them have more than 200 commits. So, and for these high bars here, four releases had 600 commits in one release. So imagine if you are not applying a weekly kernel bug fix release, you might be missing out on at least, at least 100 bug fixes into your production system. Well, the second thing is you also will be missing out on various performance improvements. This is, an, again, an example from Cloud for Production Systems. Uh, when I talk about performance improvements, I, I, I talk here about in a wider sense. So, like, it's not only about speed, but performance improvements means better uh, resource utilization. And this was the case for Cloudflare when we migrated from a 5.0 four kernel to 5.10 kernel. So uh, we, of course, we didn't upgrade everything at once. We did a limited deployment to, uh, to compare. And like just upgrading the kernel actually saved us like around five gigabyte of RAM per server. Because n nice folks from Facebook like optimized the memory management some system in one of the major kernel releases and we just got it for free, right? And like in cloud for scales, where we have like around 300 data centers acro across the world, uh, five gigabyte of RAM per server is a massive saving. If you're also, if you're not applying the releases, uh, you have the accumulating change delta problem, right? So this is kind of like the same data I presented several slides before, number of commits per release, but in, in, from a different view. So this is a total commits per release since uh, release zero. So in this, in this graph, like release one has some X amount of commits, uh, re release two shows you number of commits from release one plus release two and so on. So it, it's, it's just a different view of the data, but it, it, it kind of allows you to measure the commit delta, right? So let's say you're currently running on 5.15.16 version, and you're considering to upgrade to 5.15.32 version, right? Like 32 version is the latest. So your kind of commit delta is 2,196 commits, okay? Uh, and we, it would be natural to assume that the number of commits you are accepting in production is proportional to your risk, right? And it's, yeah, the more changes you apply, the more risk there is that something will break in, in, after the upgrade. So let's say, for whatever reasons, you want to postpone the upgrade, right? And, and you wait 
uh, you wait twice as long as you originally intended. And once you figure out that you're ready to upgrade, you're now upgrading from 5.15.16 to 5.15.48 because you waited as twice as long. And now your commit change delta is 5,436 commits in this case, right? So now we can calculate like the difference uh, or the relative com change commit delta. And in this particular case, it will be almost 2.5, right? And this is an important uh, number because it, it will show you in this particular case that for a 2x delay, you get 2.5 higher risk of a breaking change, right? So your risk of delaying the upgrade grows faster than the time you delay, which is very interesting. So therefore, like small regular releases and keeping your change delta small gives you lower risk. When you're not applying updates, you're missing out on security vulnerabilities, right? Uh, these is from bug fixes, these are other types of fixes which are introduced in every kernel weekly release. This is again data from the 5.15 kernel stable branch. Uh, I don't, didn't have the data for the latest releases. It's the data is available up to dot 54. And the important message here is out of 54 releases in this graph, 40 have at least one CVE patched, right? So almost every release has at least one CV patched. And three of those had more than 10 CVs patched. Now imagine if you are not applying a particular up kernel upgrade, you have CVs not patched, which is, and, no, and these are known public CVs, by the way. So these are not some kind of zero days and, and some research, right? And on top of risking your security, you have also compliance risks, right? So once the fix has been published, if your production system is compliant to something, you will likely have this requirement. I mean, I took the example from the PCI DSS uh, certification, but like other compliance systems have similar requirement that for a known patch, you have a limited time frame where you need to deploy it to production. And like for PCI DSS, for example, it, it's for critical components. And Linux kernel most likely is a critical component because it's an operating system, right? Your production operating system. And like for PCI DSS, you will have only like one month since the patch was introduced to release it to your production. Who here didn't heard about Equifax? Right? So Equifax didn't patch a known vulnerability and it got exploited. And it got exploited with very severe consequences, financial, for business, and everything, right? So remember, every weekly kernel release has at least one CV patched and your clock starts ticking when, when, when it gets released, right? And therefore, you know, like I remember like 10 or 20 years ago, when you go to the sysadmin forums online and like people like various sysadmin boasting like, oh, my uptime is two years, my uptime is six years. So this is not great anymore. <laughs> like if your uptime is more than 30 days, most likely you're vulnerable and you're breaking compliance, right? Um. Okay, so now that we talked about uh, the risks of not applying their braid, Let's talk about the common anti-patterns which uh, like I've encountered in my own experience working in Cloudflare and other companies as well as I've seen in other even big companies which manage production systems. So how do they approach Linux kernel upgrades and why they are wrong, right? Uh, so yeah, in many companies you have like some kind of ASA reorganization or production engineering, like in Facebook, they're responsible for production. And oftentimes it's a team which like 
manages the Linux kernel distribution is a different team. So you have to negotiate the upgrade with the production engineering team. And the problem is they try to apply the common patterns they have for any regular software to the Linux kernel, right? So remember, Linux kernel is released, bug fix release weekly, and they said like, okay, we need to upgrade every week. And like every time I come to them, they would ask, okay, but do we need to upgrade? Like, have you reviewed the change log? Which things from the change log are actually applicable to us? Can you justify the upgrade? And for the Linux kernel, it's actually not possible. We're going back to this graph, right? So more than a half of the weekly releases have more than 100 commits, 100 changes, right? So, and you just expect us, like a small you know, team, to review all of them like continuously. Like we'll be just be doing just that and like not anything else. And moreover, because of the sheer volume of the commits and changes coming into the real ground, there is a very high chance there is something from that 100 or even 600 is really applicable to your system. So you don't have to review it. You just have to take it. And like most likely, there will be something that you need. Right? Mm. When you come with an upgrade, uh, like because a uh, serious vulnerability have been uh, publicized and like everyone is screaming, uh, they would still ask us like, okay, but is this vulnerability is actually exploitable in our systems? Like I had like these questions like before many times in Cloudflare where uh, we have a like uh, privilege escalation published. But for example, they say we don't run like third party code on our servers, right? Like if we like, like yeah, we, we really can't protect from an insider attack, but like, but we don't have a possibility of someone running their sort of party code on the system and, and getting pretty. So is this security vulnerability actually exploitable? Like, can you prove that it is exploitable? But the problem is, this is the wrong question to ask, right? And uh, like, think of it from uh, this perspective. So you're running a Linux kernel with a known vulnerability, which you really don't know if it's exploitable or not. Right? And let's consider the potential attacker's perspective, the person who broke in, uh, into Equifax. Right? So who is this person, the attacker? The attacker is a person who is highly motivated to break into the system. This is their primary source of income. They know you're running a vulnerable, they potentially know you're running a vulnerable system, right? And they spend exclusively almost 24 seven all their resources, time and effort just to break into your system and find a successful exploit, right? Yeah, so the attacker is very, very determined to get into your system and does nothing else uh, just to do it, right? But we're asking this question not for the attacker. <laughs> we're asking this question for a security engineer, a Linux kernel engineer, or someone who is reviewing these patches they are different, right? So they are highly motivated to go home on time. <laughs> and most likely they are not like reviewing just this one patch, they're reviewing like many patches, not from the Linux kernel, from all the so production software that you're using. And they also have like other competing priorities like security folks, build security architecture, create tools, like do consulting, many, many, many other things, right? So it's kind of like a multitasking person. So th the disconnect here is that that person on the left is the person who will most likely has the answer, is your, this exploit applicable to you? But you cannot ask them because you don't know them, right? And they're, they're bad. But you're asking a question of the wrong person who cannot really devote that much time to produce this answer. So therefore, it's not really correct into uh, assuming that, you know, like if a security researcher would say yeah, is this vulnerability is not applicable, it's not really applicable. The safest course of action is to take and patch it, right, if it's known. Another anti-partner I s s see from uh, SREs and production engineers uh, 
they say like, okay, this is a kernel, very like scary thing. Uh, it breaks all the servers if it goes wrong. So let, let it soak for one month somewhere in Canary to ensure it's stable, right? But again, why it's an anti-pattern? Because the more you soak, the more you delay the upgrade, the more change delta you accumulate, right? Secondly, you have the security portion of it. The more you delay the upgrade, the more you're running with production system with uh, more than one CV and patch. And like, the thing is, this one month in this example was uh, not an arbitrary number. People usually somewhat come up with two weeks or one month because they think it's like enough, like they perceive it as enough. But remember, CVEs are being patched in the kernel every week. So you, your soak time cannot be larger than that, right? Because you're not only risking the security of your system, you're again risking your compliance because if your soak time is one month, there is no way you're going to deploy a known patch vulnerability to production in one month because you soak it in one month in Canary and then you'll have another one month to release it, right? Or, or two weeks or whatever. So why, why people come up with the soak times? Uh, like in my experience and my opinion, it comes down to the fact that we don't know what we're looking for. When I say like, pe ask people, why do you think one month is enough or, or two weeks is enough? So like, because they will just wait and see what happens, but they're not, they don't know what they're looking for. Instead, you should have metrics will tell you uh, like, is this kernel behaves the same as the previous one and it's acceptable to you, right? We also don't know our workload. So oftentimes, and not SREs, but other engineering teams from Cloudflare come to me and ask, like, will the new kernel upgrade break my software? I said, I don't know. <laughs> what does your software need? And, and, and like when you follow the five why rule questions, you start understanding that like, okay, some teams, uh, they, they write like a key value store and like their performance is heavily dependent on the kernel page cache. So like kernel page cache performance is very important to them. Other teams are writing like, um, uh, like we have Cloudflare Workers, which is a third party code execution system. So like scheduling and CPU performance is important. So every workload underneath has this like one or two kernel features they require. Like uh, the other team we have, like they heavily rely on Linux na network namespaces. So Linux network namespaces is the needed feature for them. And for all these features, you can actually write tests, right? And you can exercise them and uh, like compile a test suite of kernel pre-production testing, which can have unit test, integration test, performance test, but the old thing, I call it the acceptance test. So now I'm telling all the teams which come to me and say like, oh, it, will the kernel break, uh, break the bill? Or, or can the most <laughs> hilarious I heard like, oh, can we have a say if we, you're allowed to release a new kernel or not? And like, I, we have like dozens of engineering teams in Cloudflare and if I allow, <laughs> to have every one of them to have a veto, I will never upgrade the kernel because some of them will say no. But I said, you can have a veto if you write a test for us in our test framework, which we provide, and it will fail. If your test fails, we'll not release the kernel until we debug it, right? <laughs> uh, but to write tests, they have to learn their workload and what do they need from the kernel. Yeah, final thing I, I saw like in the early days of Cloudflare and which we successfully removed now is uh, when you come to people, they just, it goes back to the beginning of my presentation, they just perceive kernel as, as too scary, too risky. And they start like, okay, well, like kernel is this like mega beast, right? So uh, let's have a different approval process for release. Like if for regular software we require one approval, for kernel we'll have like three approvals from different teams. Which is actually nonsense. So what if I told you that a kernel deploy is safer than any other software, right? And again, uh, I give it as a Cloudflare example. So 
This is like cloud for network today. All these blue dots in the world are data centers, and each data center can have like many, many, many servers, right? So how does a regular software update lo uh, looks for us? So we have, of course, it's automated. We have configuration management system doing all of that. But when a new team, uh, a team like a team who manages our web server, Nginx, for example, releases a new, the new version, the way how it works is the configuration management sees there is a new version available, it upgrades the software package on each server, and then does a server restart, service restart. So depending on if the service is critical or not, uh, it can be a graceful restart or non-graceful restart, doesn't matter, it's, but it's still a service restart, so the new code takes over. So the gist of it process is if you don't put explicit safeguards to deploy new code like in a stage and slow down manner, a typical Nginx release, if it's bad, it can break the whole network. And unfortunately, Cloudflare learned it the hard way. So we had a couple of like global outages because a bad software deploy got spread across the network too quickly and almost took down the whole network. Linux kernel, for example, the biggest blessing and a curse of the Linux kernel upgrade, it requires a system reboot. Unless you do like live patching, but then you're crazy and <laughs> uh, yeah. So yeah, kernel upgrade requires a reboot, right? And to Reboot, again, for us it's all automated, but it requires more steps. It, you need to drain the traffic from the server. Uh, you need to put it out of production, means silencing things and monitoring and alerts because the server will be down for some time. Then to do actual reboots. Reboots are not fast, especially on the servers. Then when it's actually booted, our configuration manager, manager steps in and reconfigures the server, and sometimes it takes like tens of minutes. Uh, then when the server is configured, we run the acceptance test and then we put it back into production. And because nobody's crazy and like we're not crazy, uh, so you don't really reboot all the servers at once, right? Like if you have a kernel upgrade, I cannot see a process which says like let's pull down the whole network and do a reboot. So you will naturally have this process gradually. You will reboot servers one by one, or in like in our case, we do it in batches to speed it up a little bit. But it's the thing is like the kernel deploy is inherently slow paced and gradual rollout. So you have these safeguards out of the box if, if, if you're managing your production sanely, right? So it gives you Plenty of times, so like we did deploy bad kernel upgrades, but we have noticed after like two or three servers rebooted and it had almost no visible impact on our network. Did I convince you that Linux kernel upgrades are safer? <laughs> okay. So now let's a little bit, like we talked about the risks of not applying kernel upgrades, we talked about uh, what problems you might have. L let's talk about the Linux kernel releases. One of the other problems I've encountered that uh, people just perceive every kernel release as the same. It's, it's a big scary thing. But if you learn the kernel release process, you will see that not all releases are created equal. So some releases are safer to apply and some releases are, are require more testing. So kernel version numbers look like this. So you have like a number dot, another number dot, and another dot. For example, like 5.15.32, right? And it kind of looks like a semantic versioning system, right? The, the, this is the biggest mistake everyone makes. This is not a semantic versioning system in the kernel. So one thing you have to remember, kernel does not follow a semantic versioning system. Instead, it just has two components. Uh, the first two numbers, they usually called it a major or stable kernel release, uh, and the final uh, and not major minor. Like two numbers designate one thing. It's a major kernel release, right? And 
The second number is our bug fix releases. Uh, there is no established terminology whether I call it, should call it patch releases, but I call them bug fix releases. So these contain only bugs and security fixes. Another important thing to understand is these bug fix releases will never contain new features or subsystem rewrites. So they're usually quite, quite safe to apply. They only fix bugs and security vulnerabilities. So how does kernel release flow works in general? So the main line, the main bleeding edge kernel code is maintained by, still maintained by Linus. It's, well, let's call it the main branch. So the features are actually developed in, in uh, uh, various other branches uh, from subsystem, ma ma managed by subsystem maintainers. So for example, there is a drivers, uh, subsystem, there is a memory management subsystem, there is networking, and these are like other branches, and features are being developed there. And then the Linus like pulls from these branches these features like once in a while. Okay? And at some point uh, when Linus considers that his branch is, is a stable, he cuts a stable release. And the way how they do it, it, it branches out from the main branch. So they create a dedicated branch, they call it a stable branch, for lin major Linux kernel release. So we have like 5.10, 5.11, 5.12, and this usually happens every nine and 10 weeks. And when the sta then the stable branches lives, and at some point, uh, a tag is created on the stable branch which designates a bug fix release. So 5.11.1 is a bug fix release on the 5.11 stable branch, right? But how are actually bugs getting, uh, getting there, right? They don't immediately get into the uh, stable branch, so the process is if you find a bug in sub some system, you actually usually fix it on the subsystem maintainer's tree. Then eventually that bug, but you mark it as a bug fix, right? And then eventually this bug fix gets pulled in by the li uh, by Lanos into the main branch, and uh, stable branches cherry pick these commits onto themselves. And when so this is where new features are never introduced into the stable branches. So stable branches do not completely merge the mainline Linus branch, they only cherry pick bugs and security vulnerabilities. And eventually when enough bugs have been cherry picked, a new bug fix release is being cut, and it usually happens like every week with another tag. Right, so a new merge major or stable kernel version is released every nine to 10 weeks, and like even there the process is quite rigid, so they only allow like two weeks for feature development and seven weeks for bug fixing and stabilizing the kernel. They call it a merge window. The another thing is because it's not a semantic versioning, the leftmost version means nothing. So 4.19 upgrade to 4.20 may have more breaking features uh, like breaking changes or features than an upgrade to 4.20 to 5.0. This is an error like many SRE and production teams make because they say, oh, we used to upgrade from 4.19 to 4.20, but now we're upgrading to 5.0. This is probably a super major version. Like we needed to exercise. No, it's the same, <laughs> right? Uh, it's just like this leftmost number incre is incremented um, when Linus decides to. And uh, yeah, and bug fix and patch releases are released around once a week. Uh, it's the rife most version number. They just cherry pick bugs, and while they propagate through the whole tree, they get some initial testing from the Linux kernel community, so they're pretty much in good shape, and therefore you don't have new features and regressions are quite rare. Uh, yeah, but all it may contain critical security patches, and you almost want to apply them because of the sheer commits and security uh, uh, patches going to bug fix releases. There is most likely something which is affecting your system. Uh, 
yeah, let's talk about a little bit major version and stable releases. So a stable release, once it's branched out, it's being uh, supported around two or three months. So supported means these bug fixes and security patches are being backported and cherry picked into this branch. Uh, but after two or three months, it's considered end of life. So uh, at this point, you will likely might need to evaluate a new major version with new features. If it's too costly, and like, for example, in Cloudflare, we still want some stability and don't want to evaluate a new major kernel release every two to three months, there are long-term stable releases, which is usually uh, the latest stable release of the year. And uh, there, the Linux kernel community backports bug fixes and security vulnerabilities for at least two years. So it provides you more t room not to evaluate major kernel releases too often, but still uh, be on top of every bug fix and security patch out there. Yeah, and, and this, I encourage you to read this usually overlooked page about the Linux kernel releases on the official kernel.org site, and it has an explicit paragraph saying that uh, the major, major leftmost major number means nothing, and don't <laughs> don't bother, <laughs> don't bother like worrying about it too much. Okay, so based on all we learned today, we can get some safe and easy production kernel upgrade tips, right? So the first thing is what we can take out from this presentation is don't create a dedicated deploy process for the Linux kernel, right? Uh, because, as we just learned, kernel upgrades are usually less risky than uh, any other software, on the contrary, which everyone thinks. Um, and simple stage rollout is usually enough, and kernel upgrades are naturally slow-paced uh, because they require a reboot, and you will have plenty of time noticing a bad deploy and pulling the plug on, on, on the deploy process. Secondly, you have to work with your organization, with your SRE teams, uh, to avoid justifying backfill kernel upgrades. So bug fix releases should be deployed with no questions asked. And because of the volume uh, of the commits there, and uh, fixes and security patches, there's most likely there is something which is affecting your workflow, so it doesn't make sense to actually analyze if it's there and if it's worth applying. Because bug fix releases do not contain new features, regressions are quite uh, uncommon, and because of the compliance risks of security features, you should work out, build out the process which will minimize the required soak times. Instead, try to move to a metric-driven approach instead of validating a new kernel. Uh, if, again, if validating a new major kernel release is too much trouble for you, consider staying on the long-term branch. Uh, this is what actually Cloudflare does. Uh, so it gives you at least two years of bug fixes, security uh, patches, but we don't stay there for two years. Actually, after a year, the next stable uh, long-term release is already available and we immediately start evaluating. So we still have one year like we usually transition much faster than that, but we, in the end, we still have mar one year of uh, time to smoothly transition from the old kernel to the new kernel, still getting bug fixes and uh, and performance uh, and security patches, but we also get the newer features earlier than we would y wait for another year. And again, we accumulate less change delta following this process. And as we uh, learned before, change delta is bad for your risk. Yeah, and implement and improve, if you didn't already implement, if you did, improve your pre-production kernel testing for major version validation. Uh, and this will help you understand your workload, actually. Um, you can write tests which exercise various kernel subsystems required by your workload. And not only these tests will put you in a better place. If thing goes wrong, if something doesn't work, it will, they will help you to actually communicate with kernel community. Like Linux kernel is huge and nobody understands everything. Uh, 
But if you encounter problem, like on the contrary, there are some opinions out there that kernel developers are uh, really kernel upstream community is really not friendly, and they they uh, they say bad things on the mailing list. But only because if you come to them with a problem, but they cannot reproduce it. Once you have a test which is easily reproducible, and you can deliver that test to the upstream community, describing your problem, see how it fails, you will get help. And like I've, I've did it many, many times. Uh, if I have a reproducer, if I have a test, uh, like I immediately get help in any subsystem, even if I'm not an expert there. Yeah, and you should make metrics or data-driven decision, not time-based decision. So. Deci try to build your process in a way to decide if the kernel is good based on data and metrics and tests versus just let's run it for one month in somewhere and see what happens. And finally, like on continuing metrics, metrics monitoring and deploy automation can help with human risk perception, right? So apart from having this data-driven approach to decide if a kernel is good and kernel upgrade is good enough or not, it also will provide you quick early signals about potential regressions, although they're quite rare. Mm -hmm. The other point I wanted to make about automation. One other, uh, like definitely consider kernel deploy automation. So one of the early problems we had in Cloudflare because of this kernel risky perception we, we discussed in the beginning of this presentation. Uh, if you come to a, 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 an SRE, various people perceive kernel grades with different levels of risk, right? And sometimes if uh, uh, like a, a more junior employee is tasked to a kernel grade, they, they, they are just afraid, more afraid that things will go wrong and they tried all their best to actually avoid it somehow, to come up with excuse not to do it. When you have kernel automation, the human factor is not a problem anymore, right? So uh, you can roll out your kernel upgrades and uh, you don't have to deal, you don't have to put other people in this weird position where they are afraid to do something wrong because it's done for them automatically and there is no decision, human making decision involved in the process, all this data driven. I think that's mostly what I wanted to tell you today. So in this presentation, we learned that Linux kernel upgrades are actually not more risky than uh, any other software. You definitely need to patch early and patch often, especially for the Linux kernel. Uh, always apply bug fix kernel releases with no question asked. And when it comes to the Linux kernel, try to understand your workload. Try to understand your workload requirements to the Linux kernel so you can actually design tests, metrics, and monitoring to actually validate these requirements. And it will help you to stay patched and secure. Thank you. Thank you. We have two questions from the Matrix chat. The first one's from Band-Aid asking, Fedora core kernel upgrades require two reboots, whereas Ubuntu upgrades can be done in place followed by a reboot. Any idea why? Oh, no, unfortunately. <laughs> so in Cloudflare, we don't use a distribution kernel. We build our own kernel directly from kernel.org side. We call it app upstream kernel, and that requires one reboot. I played with Fedora a long time ago, and at that point, it required only one reboot, so I'm actually not sure why now it requires two reboots. So sorry, cannot answer that question. Okay, the next one is from Arc6. You mentioned that live kernel upgrades are crazy. Can you explain your thoughts on not using K-Splice or K-Patch, particularly for high severity CVs? So uh, my opinion on... Uh, on uh, KPA, like various life patching techniques, if you understand the internals of how kernel works, you will see that they have a very limited applicability. So you can only, so the way how live patching works, you have like, uh, uh, like let's say a vulnerable piece of code, uh, an algorithm, right? And you kind of like put a new one in place and like redirect all the uh, code execution from the vulnerable part to the new part. But that only works if the data structures themselves do not change. So Linux kernel 
internal API is not stable, unlike like Windows and other operating systems. So like the, str the structures can be modified at any point of time, even in bug fix releases. And if you have a CVE which requires you to modify the structure, you cannot apply live patching anymore. So basically, um, and that's why I don't like live patching, so you have to actually know when it works or not. But like many organizations think, oh, we have live patching, so we can, we're safe from like high critical CVEs. No, you, you can patch with them only like a small subset of critical CVEs. This morning, uh, to stable branches, I just checked. The, if you, did you hear about the uh, red bleed? Uh, vulnerability in Intel CPU, so like patches have just dropped bug to uh, bug fix releases on all stable branches, supported stable branches in the Linux kernel, and you cannot live patch it because it requires recompiling your code <laughs> to actually have the mitigation. So in my opinion, it's better to build a robust kernel deployment process where you can continuously reboot your machines and deploy kernel, whether actually waste a lot of effort uh, making live patching work for you and only covering a small subset of cases. We have one more in the chat, but let's turn it to the audience here. Anybody have any questions? Yes, please. So the question was, uh, because I wasn't on like, so the graph shows how many CVs are usually patched per release, but how many CVs are introduced. Uh, this goes back to the uh, question of uh, the kernel releases themselves, right? So bug fix releases, like CVs are usually introduced by new code, by new features, uh, uh, some optimizations or whatnot. So bug fix kernel releases do not introduce this. They only patch what is available. So unless the bug fix itself introduces a new vulnerability, which happens very rarely, usually there are no new CVs introduced, only like they're getting fixed. And even if like all the things bad things happen, right? So sometimes you get this, you get a regression, you get a new CV introduced by a bug fix, but the overall trend is always up, right? So you always, by continuously applying bug fix releases, you will end up, usually end up in a better place than you were before. Any more questions? Yes, please. Uh, I would recommend rolling your own kernel. Ah, sorry, the question was when you would you recommend rolling your own kernel versus using distribution kernel? I would recommend rolling your own kernel when you really know your workload, right? So, and like like in Cloudflare, for example, why we run quite like distribution kernel are usually older than the upstream ones. And like nature of our products and services, we try to utilize as many new kernel features as possible. And like, like, lin like very advanced things in Linux network namespaces where heavy users of in kernel BPF. So like distributions kernel are usually too slow for us. And sometimes, for example, you need a particular behavior from a particular subsystem and therefore running your, you, you can get the improvements faster and therefore, and sometimes you want to make some tweaks, right? Because the kernel itself like, is a good generic uh, piece of software which should be good enough for small IoT devices as well as high performance uh, systems and like servers in the cloud, but sometimes they make trade-offs and like, you would get the benefit of like, removing the trade-off they made for IoT device to make your like, server workload perform better. But that requires you to knowing what you need from the kernel. Yes, please. The question was, is cloud for Linux distribution based on another distribution? So our uh, production distribution is based on Debian. Uh, 
except for the fact that we don't run Debian kernel, we compile our own upstream kernel, as well as uh, we don't install operating system on disk, so our systems are stateless, so we kind of run the whole operating system as a live CD from RAM, and this gives us like more flexibility and ease of deployment, so when we need to uh, update the operating system or the kernel, we don't have to care about the state, we just like reboot the server and like the new operating system is there. Yes, please. Uh, I haven't checked it for a while now, <laughs> but from the top of my head, somewhere around five gig. <laughs> it, when I say stateless, so we also don't, for example, if we need to store something which is big, we bind mount the directories, let's say, like for packages, we can store them on disk, right? Or some, or, or some configuration or data. It's like the main code is in the root FS. Okay, that is all our time. Thank you so much, Ignat. Give him another round of applause, please. Thank you. Uh, the next talk here is COVID making from cyber pantries to cyber glasses. Stick around if you want, but otherwise enjoy the rest of your day and don't forget, hackers got talent tonight. Hope to see some of you there.